So welcome everybody to another episode of uh, Software Hectic Tourism Stream, this time around with uh, James Lewis. Uh, James, welcome to the show and uh, I'm really glad to have you here. Um, and of course, again, it's it's live from the Software Architecture Gathering. So James did, did a session there today. Um, James, do you want to say a few words about yourself? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um... So, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invite. It's always great to see you. It's been a, been a few years now, about, but you know, it's kind of good to see a friendly face uh, from 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 the conference scene. Um, yeah. So, hi everyone. I'm James Lewis. I work for ThoughtWix. I guess my current title is uh, technical director. I don't really know what that means. I do know it means I get sent a lot of emails asking about our SAP infrastructure and whether we need or whether I'd like to buy the names of uh, Salesforce customers of people that seems to be what technical what technical director means um uh, so far um i guess you know I'm, I'm a developer by background i've been a java developer for a long long time joined thought was 15 years ago as a developer um in that time i've played most roles uh, i've been you know i've been a tech lead what we call a account tech principal so that's you know more with responsibility across multiple teams and large programs of work um and then i suppose a few years ago I sort of put a bunch of thoughts that have been swirling around mine and other people's heads, um, including actually Stefan uh, Tilkoff, who was inspirational as well behind the idea of microservices because of his SOA background and REST background. Um, and I put that down in some form that Martin Martin and I published on Martin Fowler's site, which sort of kick-started, I guess, what's become a bit of a, um, well, almost like a revolution, really, in the way people build build software, or a lot of organisations are building software or thinking about it. Um, and since then, I've continued to, you know, muse on those topics. I've, I guess, become a bit more interested in the idea of teams and team structures and um, how they impact uh, how we build software or how organisations get stuff done. Um, and most recently, I've been sort of semi obsessed with with this idea of complexity, uh, complexity science. So. Uh, yeah, so I guess that's me. Is that is, it, is that acceptable as an intro? It's perfect. Um, and as as you said, we are uh, so so. You can really be considered one of the microservices pioneers. And um, just before we we started the stream, um, we also talked about sort of. So, so you were already talking about uh, the, the the microservices article on Martin Fowler's blog, which is I guess still one of the most cited uh, sources of information about microservices in an overview. However, there is also that. Um, Java the Unix way presentation that you did, I think in Poland, and we just figured out that it's eight years ago now. And that is probably the place where uh, the inverse convey maneuver was first uh, talked about. Um, I did a training the last few days, and of course yesterday I, I talked about that too. So that's one of the things that is that are also very fundamental to microservices. So what is the the inverse convey maneuver? What is that's a great question. Um, so, so I guess, so where, where did this come from? So, I mean, I, I sort of got interested in in the idea of, you know, of of Conway's law and reading about that probably in the late in the late you know, two thousand nine ten, working with Dan North. Really, um, you know, he's a great great mm -hmm. thinker, great intellectual around how how not just software software is built and designed and and and, and delivered, but also around how the you know the the the, so, the, the socio political side of building software then, you know, how teams are structured and how organizations work and, and that kind of thing. And he sort of pointed me at that as well as a bunch of other stuff around around flow and had had to design product development team, you know, product development organizations for flow. Um, and so I guess, the, you know, the, well, Conway's law, the idea that, um, I think probably everyone knows by now, but the idea that um, over time, the way that uh, the communication structures of a team building software will be reflected in the software itself. So mm -hmm. you know, this was, I think, 1968-9, Mel Conway came up with this or pu published a paper on this. Um, the mirror mirroring hypothesis, it was originally called, I think. And then over time, it was sort of you know, the more and more research was done, which seemed to point to this, to the fact that it was, in fact, it, it, that it, it was a, a real phenomenon. Um, and then the idea, I guess, that, you know, I think, I think for me, that Java the Unix way presentation was a, it was a really an experience report about um, a, pro a program of work I was on at the time and about how we, how we in ThoughtWorks took uh, a very, you know, a very big problem, essentially, and tried to break it up into a way that, that we could deliver within an acceptable time frame for a client. Um, and that meant that we needed multiple teams working in parallel, you know, which is, you know, 
from the from the off it's not necessarily my ideal way of writing software right you know there's a lot that can get done by five people um you know uh, on, on, on a single team um but in this case we did need to scale and and the problem when we broke it up really lent itself um when we sort of squinted a bit to to having multiple teams structured around different business capabilities so um and the idea being that you know if you have if you have a team that is building one one particular thing uh, and they're they're dedicated to that particular thing then conway's law the inverse conway maneuver you know build the um the team structure you want the organization you want and you know the architecture will follow kicking and screaming was my colleague evan botch's description of the in, inverse conway maneuver um so what we sort of thought was if we've got you know we've got to build these business capabilities, we've got to build this software that it's got these capabilities user management you know access management i am you know stuff it's got fulfillment in there it's got all these other all, all these other things well you know let's let's organize teams around those capabilities let's have small teams but building user management so it's everything to do with creating users managing um you know, user accounts and all that kind of thing um and that that's really for me where that's sort of where that started and, and that's where i sort of, I talk a bit about that in the in java the unix way i think i was calling it calling the micro applications at the time micro apps rather than microservices which came a little bit later here yeah. um but i mean you know it's and it's still i still think it's um a really still va not just valuable but underused approach actually to building software and to structuring um structuring software one of the you know me i do tend to have a habit of waffling so just i don't know wave a card at me or shout or something <laughs> um but one of the one of the things i've been privileged to go to is a, a workshop um, at uh, a guy called Dave Thomas, Badara Dave Thomas's um, place, mm -hmm. and in one of those one of those workshops, Mel Conway was actually there. He was invited as well, so I had the great you know, privilege and pleasure of of sitting down and, and talking about about his work, his research at length with a number of others who you know are in the software architecture space about and about the length, you know, what we've done with Conway's Law over the years. And I, th I heard this, it was a really great story from um, Adrian Cockcroft, I'm sure he won't mind me telling it, where, you know, he, they, they deliberately designed their team structures in Netflix according to the, essentially the in, in, inverse Conway maneuver, down to where they sat in the building, you know. Because um, there's, there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of research going back years and years. There's a guy called Thomas Allen who did wrote a PhD thesis on the distance that people sitting from each other, you know, the, the, the effect of distance um, on knowledge work when people, you know, in, 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 in the stuff that we do. Um, I think it's something like six, six to seven meters and after which you've got zero probability more or less of having a, a serendipitous conversation, you know, which you, know, you put all this stuff together. What it means if you want, if you've got people you want to talk to each other a lot, you sit in close together, right? You know, so, which is another kind of Conway's law kind of idea. So, you know, in Netflix's case, if you've got the UX, the UI folk who are building for multiple platforms all over the place, televisions, and we all know, then you sit them next to the platform API team, mm -hmm. right? The folk who are taking, you know, essentially, they've got a big, it's like a big BFF in, in some senses. You sit the, those folk next to that because that, those are the people they need to talk to the most. They need to make requests for new features or new um, new APIs or, or new fields in, in APIs or whatever it is. Um, but they don't need to sit next to the people who are managing Cassandra, right? Because they, they, they don't really have much to do with Cassandra rings and, um, you know, that kind of thing. So you, you sit those a long way away from them, you know, because the, they don't need to have that form of conversational change. I think we, we sort of talk about it as, um, you know, um, rather than having it as, you know, doing versioning and all this. So, yeah. So, I mean, so I, I think there's some really, there's some really exciting things that you can actually do with it when you take it almost like reductio ad absurdum, you know, deliberately sit the people who you want to talk to to each other next to each other and keep the others a long way away, you know. And it has impact on things like distribution of work, right? I mean, across across the world, I mean, you know, when you're doing things like distributed delivery, quite common to have you know teams working across India, maybe the US, maybe the UK, maybe Germany, wherever whatever it is. Don't don't have them working on the same capability, right? You know, have them working on things that are discrete because the geographical distance will enforce those architectural boundaries you know, in, in a way that would be positive or you would hope it's positive. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I found two things quite interesting from what you just said. So uh, one thing is that uh, you were talking a lot about uh, people should be sitting next to each other. So it's more like, like uh, in a way, what you're saying is the communication uh, structure depends on whether people are sitting next to each other. So that's an interesting thing uh, that, that I noted. And the other thing that I found interesting is that you said it's un underused. 
so and I thought that the, I don't know in my bubble it seems that the, that there's a huge um, fuss and hype around Conway's law and how it it influences everything. So I thought that was interesting. Um, having said that, what would you do differently now? I mean, eight years have passed. So um, and you said it's it's underused. So would your advice be to do? the inverse combi maneuver and use it more frequently or is there anything else that that you think should be done differently nowadays or maybe it shouldn't be done at all nowadays so what do you think that's, that's, a, that's a great question I, I mean what would i do differently i mean we, we were hey all you 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 people watching out there just before you're know, raising the the, the the curtain a bit on this just beforehand we were talking a little bit about warhammer 40,000 um and there's a great thing in warhammer 40,000 around you know the, the, the kind of the intro to it is about that all the technology that's been lost never to be refound and all this mm -hmm. kind of thing like the dark ages and i do i do think in some, you know in some senses as an industry we have to relearn everything over and over again we're, we're a bit like the dark age of the imperium in the sense that we have to relearn all the time and actually looking back at that that presentation thinking back at the things we were doing on that on that team and that program i think actually a lot of it we're not doing a lot of that stuff anymore or certainly i don't see it i don't i don't see it become i don't see that it's become the de facto way of de developing software so you know we talked about conway's law you have the team structure well how do the teams Talk to each other. How, what what AP, what structure do you put in terms of the APIs between teams? And we don't. I, I don't know. Maybe this is just me, and maybe this is just the organisations I've been working with. But we don't tend to. I don't tend to see a lot of organisations thinking about things like domain application protocols or thinking about you know um, minimising cognitive load in terms of the APIs they're developing. You know, choosing something like we did back then with Atom and Atom Pub because it's a, a consistent way that all the teams can speak with one another. You know, these days, I don't know about you, but I, I still hearken off to the days of XML. You know, I used to like XML, um, you know, but hey, Jason, Jason, Jason seemed to win. Um, and we have to tunnel XML through Jason now, which is kind of frustrating. Um, but, you know, looking back, I think it's, I, I think there's, there's a lot of things that, because it's not just, it's not just sit teams next to each other or sit teams further away. It's how are those, how are those, the interfaces between those teams going to work? what thoughts do you have to put into api design what thoughts do you need to put into evol you know, evolution of apis mm -hmm. those sorts of things which come together with conway's law i think you know it's, it's it, they're sort of additive in a sense um and that's why i sort of think about a little bit about the microservices idea we talked about um you know smarts in the endpoints not in the pipes that's kind of what we were talking about you know being considered and considerate mm -hmm. about how you interacted via um via 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 software with, with other with other parts of your organization and, and it, it seems very much that we've i don't know it's the we, we seem to have jumped on the everything is swagger now right as long as we've got a swagger like uh you know con, well, that's fine we're done you know, actually that's <laughs> that's not a domain application protocol right that's just <laughs> that's just that's just a, a swagger definition but yeah um so i think that's a very good point and and to me it seems nowadays that we are basically uh, relearning modularization in a way with with uh, microservices uh, one thing that is sort of a good i think almost an obvious question so you said you should sit people who are working together on one thing should sit next to one another with uh, the corona pandemic uh, obviously that's not really a choice so what's your advice uh, for all the remote work that we have nowadays, what is the equivalent of sitting, setting people next to each other and having them share a room? So, so what's your advice there? Yeah, that's the one thing I think. I mean, you talk to anyone who's writing software at the moment; it's the one thing that we all wish we could do, right? In, 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 well, mm -hmm. we're getting a huge amount of benefit from having this ability to to maintain more of a work life balance to work when we want, where we want, this kind of stuff. But I think we all recognize we've lost something. We've lost, even if you can use an electronic whiteboard to sketch some ideas qu quickly, or even if Slack now has a, a mechanism for very quickly jumping into a video call with your with your teammates, you know, that doesn't that doesn't compensate for those, you know, the overheard someone behind you saying, oh, I've got this terrible problem with this particular login framework. And well, I had that problem three weeks ago. I can help you with that. You know, that We've we've lost a lot of that. Um, in terms of my advice, 
I mean, so we still do things like um, we still pair program a lot in Thorwix. That's pretty much de facto a sensible default for all our teams. So we've had to discover ways of making that much more effective than we have done previously, making sure that, you know, like Zoom burnout is a thing and Zoom pair programming burnout is like a real, real thing, right? You know, so how do you manage that? How do you manage, you know, be more diligent about core pairing hours, for example? Um, you know, it's taken us a, a while to realize that you can replicate the sort of things you would have in a team room, but in 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 the virtual world. So I'm not just talking about a Trello board or Jira board or whatever. I mean the to- the sort of board you would see on a on a on a on, a, on an NAQ project or on a Thoughtworks project, or an Agile project, where you've got it's not it's not just swim lanes with work in it. It's avatars of people on them. It's who's off on holiday. It's the quotes. It's the you know it, it's the team charter and all those things that you want you need to be able to see. I think which makes makes a team a cohesive whole as opposed to being a group of individuals you know open source is a fantastic way of building software clearly um but it's not the perfect way of building software otherwise we we would have all found this a long time ago you know um so you know my my advice would be to to you know not don't settle maybe for the tooling that's there put some effort into recreating the things that you valued previously and if the things you valued previously were you know i remember like that java the unix way project for example we were heavily it was all all it was it was uh you know level three richardson level three rest so you know all the all the status codes for where whether mm-hmm. people were on holiday so all the you know the the, the you know the, the parts on the board where people are on holiday they were all http status codes so if someone rolled off the project you know their avatar would move into the 410 uh, gone, kind of, um, you know, kind of like the area of the of the board. All those sorts of things that makes actually what we do fun, and that's um, yeah. You know, I, I have zero time for folk who say that, that that work shouldn't be fun. And at work, what we do is the most privileged thing I think we can do. You know, it's it's using our brains, turning and 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 and, and creating this amazing so it's some stuff from nothing essentially and it should be fun you know that that's a and, you know so try, trying to recreate that environment i think is the is the important thing okay um thanks a lot for the advice so um one thing that so as you you wrote that that article together with uh, martin and mm-hmm. as you did did that presentation um i think there is an interesting quote or maybe it's a, a title of a talk by sam newman who wrote that book about microservices obviously also a former colleague of yours and uh, he seems to see microservices as a last resort nowadays which seems to imply that you shouldn't really use microservice microservices unless you really have to so what's your take on that is that an advice that you would give to people too so, so it's so nuanced. I mean, you know, so so incidentally, Sam was also on that project, on that program, of the Java, the Unix way program. He was he was the build monkey. We used to call them build monkeys back in the day in Thorwick. He was he was my DevOpsy person, which is which is quite, quite <laughs> funny. It was quite a team we had. Um, I mean, it, it's I mean, so there's a reason. So I'm involved in building the technology radar with Thorwick, the te- mm. uh, Rebecca Parsons Technology Advisory Board, as part of that. And there's a reason microservices is, is stuck in trial. It's never moved into adopt. Whereas adopt is, is you know, adopt, we say, this is the sensible default. Adopt is really strong advice from us. We think that all things considered, you should be doing this. Um, and, I, I, and there's a reason it's not moved into adopt. It's because the advice around it is so nuanced, you know. Uh, I think, you know, Sam is, I haven't seen that talk, but I can totally sympathize with where, with where Sam is coming from. That it should be something that is a considered option as opposed to being a default option. Um, well, going all the way back to again, God, we're going back to that talk a lot. You know, I think even there and ever since, I've tried to emphasize the fact that what that microservices really are a set of sensible patterns that have come together, right? So, and then I'm mm-hmm. turning them all up to eleven. Nothing says you have to forget all the other software architecture patterns, right? <laughs> Nothing, nothing says that because you're using microservices, suddenly all Gregor and Bobby's work on enterprise integration patterns gets thrown away, or that you don't think about um, you know different types of of of, of you know, event driven versus request response. All these things you still have to think about all this stuff, and then sometimes when you've got the requirements that point you in the direction of microservices, then it's 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 a good idea to use microservices. 
there are lots of other times it probably isn't. I, saying that, the caveat on the other side is I don't see many, many projects now that we, and I say projects as a, it's an art, it's an artifact of, of working in a consultancy um, that aren't microservices actually. Uh, maybe that's because we're doing a lot of things like legacy replacement work. Um, we're doing a lot of more enterprise modernization work, taking bigger, older platforms where you know the, the the problems are obvious. They've be, they've gotten massive and too big over time. They're doing too much. They've got you know they've they've they've, they've become like those black holes. You know black hole systems mm-hmm. where they they have their own gravitational field and pull pull all the functionality into them. Um, so then the, then the natural thing is to say, well, how are we going to break this up? How are we going to um, take this particular bounded context and implement it as a separate system, as a separate set of services potentially, mm-hmm. so that other people you know people can work on them independently from this thing. Um, so as I say, yeah, it's, it's I, I do have I do have a lot of sympathy with what with where Sam's going. And if I was going to build a system from scratch, would I would I pay pay the cost of the runway, if you like? So you know, Evan Botcher again, he he talks about you know the having to build this super long runway for microservices. You've got all the kind of monitoring stuff. You've got all, all the stuff you need to know: observability, chaos engineering, potentially testing in production. Which isn't 101 software, you know, software um, software development. Do you, do you want to pay that that price initially, or um, is it worth? Is it better off to to get something running, earning money, and then evolve it? I think I think there's also a, a massive sunk cost fallacy with what we do. There always has been, and that's inherent in the way we fund stuff. Right? We fund things around projects as opposed to products. And that's why products not projects is, is one of the microservice characteristics we identified because if you think about things as a product then you should be able to build something learn more rebuild it learn more rebuild it that's what product engineering is about you know whereas the, the kind of product project funding model where you're you've got a bunch of stuff you build a thing and it's supposed to be perfect and then you walk away and leave it and that's it and it sits in your books and you know 10 years later maybe you turn it off because it's you know um it's, it's off your books now that that sort of i think approach is has led to in some senses to these questions because if you think about if you think about building software as a, as a as an evolutionary process that never finishes then the idea of starting or not with microservices kind of is is less of a question, right? Because we can start with one thing, and as I say, when we learn more, we'll break a bit up. But that, that, as I say, that means the funding has to be available to do that, and the project, pro, pro, sorry, product management needs to give the team the capacity to do that, um, the space to do that, um, and that often is not the case. Mm-hmm. Um, so. One other thing, so so before we started the the stream, that you said that you were really interested in in flow, and uh, that was, it made me curious. So, what what kind of flow? What what is flow, and why is it so important to you? So, I remember, I remember probably back in two thousand nine again, um, Dan North um, t- talking to me about this like, amazing product management thing called Principles of Product Development Flow. Don Rylance in his book. And I sort of read it back then. I thought, well, I mean, it's an extremely difficult book to get through because it's incredibly um, mathematical in lots of places, and it's uh, it's quite dense. And at the time, I thought, well, that's interesting, you know. And then I was going to a conference in in in, um, in Australia, yeah. And I, Don was, you know, seeing the conference. And I thought, oh, well, I better read that book again. You know, I'll probably end up sitting next to him at dinner or something. That would be quite embarrassing if I did. So I kind of read I, you know, 24 hours straight on the plane over to Australia, read the whole thing, and just it blew my mind. And it, I think it, it 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 sort of crystallized so much in my mind about the about both the the benefits of how we've learned to build software in a structured, you know, software engineering way is, you know, Dave Farley is very keen on this idea that we've, we're approaching engineering now because we've got repeatable processes around continuous integration, delivery, you know, deploying into production, audit, all the security, all that sort of stuff is approaching something, something that's sort of engineering like. Um, so you've got that on the one hand. And on the other hand, you've got this idea of, you know, how do you, how do you, all the pathologies then of organizations that, where everyone's sitting in them going why does everything take so long to get done essentially and for me the idea of this this idea of flow of the flow of work or ideas or information really cuts to the heart of both of those things and continuous delivery you know is the i guess the epitome of quote an agile process in a sense 
where you're talking about single piece flow, a piece of work that can move from idea through into production, ide ideally automatically, but maybe with a button or whatever, you know. Um, you've then got the idea of, you know, of, of um, that sort of idealized flow and continuous delivery. Um, you've then got the idea of, you know, kind of flow in, um, in how we set teams. So back to Conway's law, um, you know, why are platform product engineering teams a good idea, for example? Why why is AWS and self-service cloud such a great idea? Because it's about flow. It's about having enough, you know, the ability within a single team to get everything done that you need to get done um, without having to ask someone else and interrupt the flow of work through to production. You know, that's you know, the, the idea that you invert the invert control on, you know, a platform team offers a self-service way of giving you of, of getting stuff yourself mm -hmm. means that you don't have to put a ticket in a queue, which means you know you don't have to have a bunch of people that are sitting there servicing tickets in a queue, which means you're not waiting for a long time until someone serviced that ticket and then you've got the thing you want, yeah, which impedes flow. So I don't know. The whole thing for me, it's these days I I, I tend to think in solely in terms of improving flow, improving um, improving flow from ideas into production, improving flow from you know goods. Uh, yeah, from raw raw materials into into products, improving flow from um, like we are having terrible problems in the UK at the moment, the flow of goods through our borders, right? So I mean, it's <laughs> who'd have thought if you don't have you know any um mm -hmm. if you don't have any the ability to move goods around that you'd end up with no food on the shelves? Well, it turns out that's what happens, right? If you don't think about flow. So um, for me, it's mm -hmm. it's it's essentially all about flow. Yeah, and uh, I think that's. That's quite interesting, and it's related to to lean, I guess. And lean is also yeah. sort of the the origin of agile. So it all comes together, I guess, at at one point. It's, I mean, for me, agile, right? You can, I, I've come to describe agile in three in three th three phrases, or well, maybe, maybe yeah, three phrases. Um, it's uh, it's small batches, which is which is about flow, right? It's fast feedback and it's discipline. Those are the that's agile, right? If you do, if you have those three things, then you're doing, then you're being agile, I think. Yeah, pro probably we should come up with with a new agile manifesto, right? That that t talks about those those three things. And I, I I would actually agree a lot. I think that's that's really the fundamental fund foundation. Um, so we have a few minutes left, and there is actually a question on the chat. So and and that's quite a different question. So. Uh, Mivo on uh, YouTube asks, are you suggesting that every developer should know AWS? I feel like in most cases, there is always special people, roles at companies that do most of the cloud configuration. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. No, I'm not suggesting every developer needs to know. By extension, by every developer needs to know everything. Um, what I'm suggesting is you, that in order to get stuff done most effectively, most efficiently for flow, then you need to have the things you need within a team to get that stuff done. So, you know, not that everyone needs to be able to configure um, a, a, you know, to be able to write Helm charts or whatever, but it's, it helps if you've got someone who can write help, Helm charts that's sitting two foot away from you or is a Slack channel away, um, you know, Slack message away um, in order to, you know, rather than have to submit a ticket to the ops team where all the people who write Helm, Helm charts live. And, you know, because that essentially acts as a, uh, MNQ, right? So you've got, you know, you've got Jira tickets with, I'd like a Helm chart, please. I'd like another Helm chart. I'd like another, and you've got four people on this end. You've got four people servicing those tickets. That's as fast as you go, right? Whereas if you can write it yourself, you remove that, you remove that constraint. So no, not everyone needs to know everything clearly, but if you've got enough, if you've got people who have got a broader range of skills, um, then that that's very useful, I think. Uh, so there, there is a follow-up question and or comment, and uh, he said that that's related to self-contained uh, teams. So maybe as a follow-up question, so would you suggest that in every team there should be someone who knows AWS or Helm charts in in your example, or would it be enough to have some experts? Well, um, so this and this comes back to how do you solve for limited um, resource, right? So. You know, you've, there's a bunch of people you tend to have that are like that. So you've got your security people who, you know, everyone should have a base level understanding around security, but not everyone is going to is going to be able to do, you know, really good threat modeling sessions, for example, um, or will know the in, in, ins and outs of current um, attack vectors and blah, 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 blah. 
they're going to be constrained resources. Similarly, with the people who are deep experts in, say, Kubernetes configuration or, heaven forbid, Zookeeper, you know, those are going to be constrained resources. The best way I've found to manage that, again, is to kind of invert the model. Don't raise a ticket, in a sense. Have those people out as consultants to the rest of the organization, whether they're working, you know, at the start of a project to help something to set stuff up and then check in, or whether they are, you know, um, on a part-time basis on a regular cadence, again, cadence improves flow, um, checking in with teams over time. But I mean, in an ideal world, everyone could do everything. Turns out, um, turns out, you know, it's life is not an RP, a computer RPG, right? We can't all have all the skills and level them up over time. <laughs> Yeah, and probably that's important to, to realize that. So thanks a lot for, for uh, being here. Uh, we will take um, a few minutes break. So we will be back at uh, uh, 6.35 p.m. And then my colleague Lisa will talk to uh, Feline uh, Hermans, um, another uh, speaker from the Software Architecture Gathering. So thanks again for being here. Thanks a lot for the discussion. And uh, I hope you have a great evening over in the UK and I hope to see you soon again somewhere at some conference or wherever. Okay. Yeah. So. Thank you very much. And oh, Feline's amazing. So I'm going to log in for that, I think. Okay, great. Looking forward to it. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.
go. Hi there. This is the second interview from Software Architecture Gathering with uh, Software Architecture and Stream. My guest tonight is Felina Hermanns. Um, before we start uh, talking about how to read complex code, Felina, do you want to um, say a few words about yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Felina Hermans. I'm an associate professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands, where I teach programming to students. So these are uh, university students, 18 year olds and a bit older. I also teach programming in a high school. So those are 14, 15 year olds that I also teach programming. And I developed a programming language called Hedy that specifically aims for that age group in the high school that I teach in. That sounds very interesting. Um, we are going to talk about the uh, thing about reading complex code. I think most books are uh, focused on writing complex code. Um, why did, did you start your researches on reading complex code? Yeah, I think you, you already sort of said it. Like many books that we have about programming talk about how to write code, how to write efficient code or how to write understandable code that's more easy for other people to understand. But we don't really often talk about how to write, so how to read code. And of course you can say, well, it is the other person's responsibility to write readable code. And that is important too. But sometimes you're really stuck with code that is very hard to read. And then I found there isn't that much research about this, like books or videos or talks that really say, okay, well, you have this very complex code base and you don't understand. Now, what do you do? So I thought that would be a really good topic to dive into more. And uh, tomorrow you're going to uh, to give this talk about the topic, but there's also a book about the topic, I guess, at the programmer's brain. Um, are the talk and the book related to each other or I'll say? Yeah, absolutely. So the book is a bit broader than the talk. So the talk tomorrow will really be about how to read code, what kind of strategies you can use if you're confronted with complex code. And the book is more about all cognitive processes that happen in your brain. And there are specific cognitive processes that can happen when you're reading code. So the talk tomorrow will cover the first four chapters of the book, more or less. But the book has more, also the book has uh, information, for example, about how to deal with interruptions. So you're programming, we all hate this, right? You're in, you're, you're, you know, you're in the zone and you're having fun and then someone comes in and you're interrupted. This is very much a cognitive process that's related to programming. This is not really about writing code. That's more, uh, about reading code. That's more about writing. Uh, but th So this is in the book, but not in the talk tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so we have to do some advertisement um, because there's a 35% discount code for your book and there's a chance to win your book, of, um, a free copy of the ebook. Um, and I guess Eberhard will put the links into the chat, though the audience can participate in the um, Yeah, in this, um, I forgot the name, win game <laughs> um, for this book. Um, so before we get into the, um, the topic we wanted to talk about, have you got one tip for me what I can do when I'm interrupted while coding? Or is it yes, complex? definitely. Okay. <laughs> no, I can. I have many tips, many tips for the book, but I can give you one tip. I think it's really nice if you're working in a team to normalize taking a few minutes. So if someone wants to interrupt you, you can say something like, okay, you know, give me a few seconds to just store my mental model. This is something we talk about in a book that you sort of visualize in your brain what the code is doing. So you can say, if, if people are com comfortable with these terms, you can say, okay, one second, I just need to store my mental model. And then you can write something for yourself, like, oh, my next step was going to be this and this. Or don't forget, if you come back to the code, that this, this Boolean does not mean what you think it means. Like this little information. So dumping, like, storing your mental model in a comment, or it can be posted, it doesn't really matter how you do it. That's really one, one tip that if everyone does that, then it makes it easier to get back into work because we, we research shows, we talk about that in the book, that it can take like 15 minutes after an interruption to get back into this level. I think this is not a surprise for many people in the audience that we all know this and it is unavoidable because you know you have colleagues and sometimes they need your help. So that's definitely a tip is to say, wait, 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 and then dump, dump your model in, in, in a place. But sometimes also the question will, will um, put me out of my thoughts, but there's nothing I can do really. Or No, well, there's, also, there's another tip in the book that's also quite nice. It's a little bit more involved. There's a, a tool you can buy called Flow Light. And this is a little like a traffic light with red and orange ah. and uh, green. And this can be connected to your IDE. 
So your IDE guesses based on your click speed and your scroll speed and how often you're switching things. I don't know, this is not my tool. I don't know the exact magic, but you can imagine that from an IDE, your computer can guess if you're super busy or just like a little bit busy. And then you can have this light on your desk um, and then other people can see, oh, she's very much in the zone because this, the traffic light is red or, oh, she's just you know browsing and she's doing lower energy tasks. That's definitely something that is better but then again, that's harder to do because then you have to buy the light and you have to connect it to your machine. But it is definitely better because you're very right. Taking this maybe half a minute or a minute to store your mental model, this is helpful. But indeed, if someone already comes in and then your brain can't help but start thinking about the question, yes, this is true. So of course it is better to indicate when you don't want to be interrupted. Okay, thank you for those uh, recommendations. Um, so we wanted to talk about code reading um, and not about code writing. Um, what can I personally do to um, improve my code reading skills? There are many things you can do, and we sort of divide them in the book in three categories. So firstly, what you can do is make sure that you have the right prior knowledge for the code. Mm -hmm. That if you're reading code in, a, for example, in a programming language, you don't really know very well, then you're not going to make great progress. Like I know a little bit of German, but not that much. So if I have to read a German newspaper and I have to like Google every other word, I'm just not going to make progress. And this is the same for programming. And, and then you might think, oh, you know, I more or less guess what this programming language is doing. Even switching from something like Python to JavaScript, which is like conceptually quite similar, but because you have to figure out little mm -hmm. things like all oh, the three equal signs, this takes too much energy and you will really slow yourself down by looking up a lot. So firstly, that's important that you know the things that the code base is using, not just technical concepts, but also domain concepts. The same is true if you have to Google every other domain concept, that's also not very helpful. So that's like step one. Step two then is to make sure that the code base is aligned with your prior knowledge. I often give this example of list comprehensions or lambdas. These are things that you might know, but maybe you're not super familiar with it. Maybe you're more used to the style where functions are explicitly declared rather than using anonymous functions, or you're more used to having loops that create lists and list comprehensions. If there are many places in a code base where you're like, yeah, I know this, but it's not super familiar, you can rewrite the code to be a, clo a bit closer to your own prior understanding. And I call this in the book a cognitive refactoring. So it's like refactoring because you're not changing the code, but you're moving the code closer to your own understanding. And then maybe, you know, you throw away this refactoring later. It's not necessarily refactoring to commit, but that's also something you can do. Make sure that the code base is in good shape for you, that you have the good prior knowledge and that you massage it to be perfect for you. And then the final thing, the third thing that you can do is try to to get a sense of how hard your brain is working. And if your brain is really, really working hard, if you feel yourself, sometimes this is how it happens for me, that I have to take my finger and my finger goes on the screen, then I know this is too much, right? And I know it's like, this is too hard. And that's where you want to step to extra tools. For example, drawing a diagram um, or using a state table, all sorts of things you can do to support your memory. So those, those are the three big ideas in the book that we talk about that ease code reading. Okay, uh, and um, I think we should go through those three um, facts and uh, see what we can do in each uh, category. Um, let's start with the proper knowledge of the core stuff like programming language and domain concepts. Um, I, I think, yeah, that's not that easy uh, to do within a, a project when we, are, um, we have to understand that code quickly, but but I have to understand it right now. And uh, unfortunately, it might be um, Java, but I'm doing JavaScript 90% of the time. What can I do in this case? Yeah, so it sounds like it sounds like it, an expensive task to learn something, right? You're like, oh, I have no time to learn this. So I will just, you know, plow on. Ultimately, it might be a little bit more effective to do learn a few concepts, especially if you plan to stay in a code base for a long time. One of the techniques that we describe in the book as well is using flashcards, which are often used for second, second language learning, oh. where if you want to learn German on one side of a card, you put German, and then on the other side, you put English or Dutch, and then you train yourself. 
This is also something you could do with Java and JavaScript or with domain concepts. You, you say, oh, well, shipment, this is what it means. This is what it means for the customer. This is what it means in the German translation if you're new to a natural language code base as well. And it's really like, it sounds like, oh, I have no time for this. But of course, ultimately it will slow you down. And it's not also just a matter of slowing you down. You might also make mistakes because you have almost good, like almost mm. correct understanding of a concept. Like, oh, I think I understand this. And then it turns out to be not exactly the same. Like some stuff I myself made the switch from C sharp to Python. Mm. And then you're like, oh, object oriented programming. I know this, I understand classes and methods. This will be easy, object oriented in programming in Python. And then everything is like slightly different which maybe even is worse than entirely different. Like if you go from C-sharp, I don't know, to Haskell, then at least you know that everything you know is wrong. Um, so then you think that it's not worth the time to invest in some prior knowledge, but, but in fact, it could very quickly pays off and it's not very, very hard to learn concepts. It also has something to do with the culture of programming, I think. I mean, we often tell each other like, oh, syntax doesn't matter. You know, you can just Google syntax. Yes, this is sort of the same as, yes, I can read German because I can Google every word. I can do this. It's just not going to make me very effective. And also, I will not write very pretty German poems if I have to look up words. So I will not be effective or creative. So it is worth it quicker than you think. Mm -hmm. um, do you think uh, we could do something as a team uh, to improve this understand uh, understanding of the code and the... Um domain with the flashcards maybe in as a, a mob thing or something like this or a team task definitely yeah so strengthening your long-term memory is something you typically do alone a bit more the flashcards but there are many other things you can do as a team something that i describe in the book and that i've also been doing for almost two years now is the idea of code reading clubs where people get together and this can be done we have an open code reading club every first tuesday of the month Random people from the internet participate, but you can also do it with a development team in a company. And we found that people really enjoy doing that. And you just take a piece of code and you read it together. And it's very lovely because it both helps you understand what are different strategies that people use, what are different things that people value. For example, we have this exercise where we say, what is the most important line of code? And that, that says more about you than about the code, right? What is the stuff that you value? So some people will say, well, I very much care about what this, what this code exposes, mm -hmm. that that's what's most important. And other people say, no, the import statements are most, most important because it is most important what this depends on and where it fits in a, in a library or something. Um, but also in addition to learning about you and about code also, it's very like nice, especially for beginners that like I am there in the code reading club and they're like, oh, you know, she's a professor. She must know all the programming languages. I know no programming language as well. So then I'm also struggling with code. And I'm more like, oh, wow. But you're like supposedly the expert. I'm like, well, you know, we did some Swift code once. I had never seen Swift. I was like, what is this? It's very hard. So also in a team, you will see that some of the juniors can see that even for seniors, taking code that they haven't worked on for a long time or code that they've never seen, this will always be hard. And that's such a good lesson. That of course, you can say this to juniors, right? You can say, oh, you know, when I just started working here, it also took me three months. But I don't really believe that. They think yes. you say that for being nice. And then you make a, a mistake in, uh, in reading the code, which is also a cheap mistake because you're not really actually committing. You're just reading. And then they're like, oh, it's actually true. It is really hard for them. That's such a like, great team building activity we have found. So that's for sure something you can do in your team that will be nice to do and help team culture and also help you co your code reading skills. How would you choose a piece of code to look at in this, um, in this meeting? Yeah, that's a great question. So we found that it really doesn't matter. You just go to GitHub and you take something random. But people, again, people don't believe us. They say that, that, that you know, it really very much matters. You have to have this experience. So on the website, and this is codereadingclubs.org, we have a few starter packages. So you can take a starter package and it has an agenda for your meeting with exercises that you can do. And it also has some example code snippets. You can take whatever you want, but if you're like, oh, I really don't know, you totally take our examples. They all come from GitHub, so they're free to use. And also the code reading club stuff, everything is open source and free to use. Very cool. Um, do you want to say something else to this first part or sh should we um, step over to the next uh, 
fact you told I guess, us? I think we can uh, we can step over to the <laughs> next fact. Okay, uh, so the first thing was um, you don't know the programming um, language as well or the domain concept. And the next thing is a bit deeper in the code. Um, you mentioned lambdas as a... Um, Uh, an example for it, co uh, cognitive refactoring, you called it. Um, yes. What can I do to improve my cognitive refactoring or to improve this um, things? Yeah, so you definitely need an understanding of the type of things you are most familiar with. Like, how do you want to organize things? And I found that this can be really, really personal. So sometimes I have an, an open source, uh, an open source project, the programming language I work on. And sometimes people commit code to my open source repository and then now I run the test and it works and I check out the feature and it works. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I, you scan the code. You're like, oh, this, this yeah, it sort of makes sense. And there's some documentation. So you accept this. But then once you have to interact with that code, sometimes it's just written in a different style. And Lambda is just one example. What do people do? Do they make really small functions? Do they make bigger blocks? Um, do they tend to use filters and maps or do they tend to use loops and if statements in the loops? So it's good if you know yourself and if you know what type of thing is familiar to yourself and then you can re, you know, you can massage the code a little bit to make it closer to, to your, your own understanding. Something else, this is something I literally did yesterday is I was doing something really complicated in two classes. So I had to do a little bit here and a little bit there. And that's just, it takes your brain more energy to switch between just between the files. And every time your eyeballs have to be like, oh, where am I? So what I did, and of course, this isn't proper. This is why it's not a, an actual refactoring. Later, you put it back. It's like, okay, I will take the constructor from the one class. I, and this is Python, so you can do that type of thing. I'll just take this and I'll just put it here. And I'll just define the class in, the, in another method. That is not on the class. It is just in front of my face. I call the, the constructor and I do all sorts of stuff that I should do in the, in the constructor in the other file. This is really nice because then there I can see, okay, so now I have the object and this object has to connect to the other. I do this and do this and always need to write fields. And then it saves me so much time to first do a cognitive refactoring in which I make the code worse. I have some people might now be shouting at their computer like, no, don't put those two classes into each other. This is, this is ugly. But for the activity of making the change, where I was like, I'm not sure if this is worth, I don't know if this will work. You first do it in one view and all that switching code files, it is just nicer that you don't have to do that. And then it works. I'm like, okay, I can see how this works. And then I put, it, of course, all the stuff that actually goes in the other class, I put it there. Mm -hmm. you, you, you later, in most cases, will put the code back as it was. Of course, with a small change, but that those are examples of cognitive refactoring where like the shape of the code as it is now isn't optimal for my prior understanding or the shape of the code isn't optimal for the thing I'm doing now. So you first make a change to the code, for example, inlining a method or rewriting something to a style that fits yourself better. And then you do your changes and then you roll the original change back. But this is something I um, I only can improve or can do when I have the code um, before my face. Um, but there's nothing I can do um, beforehand when I, I, I'm going to go into a project. I cannot um, have a list like, okay, every time I find a Lambda, I will uh, rewrite it because I know I can understand those things better. Um, or is there anything I really can do beforehand? Ah, oh, that's an interesting question. Yeah, I would say if I start working on the code base, I always want to like run the code and see that it executes. But I can imagine also a scenario in which you're, for example, deciding, am I maybe interested in contributing to this open source project where you would then would just be browsing the code to see if it fits? I guess then there you really want to gain a feeling for like how, how much does this look like something I could have written? Like, is it something that sort of feels well in my belly? Like, oh, it's, this feels familiar or it feels very complicated. But then again, that's not the only thing you'll decide on. I mean, some people contribute to a project because they really care about the project, even though it's not written in a style they very much like. Um, do, do you want to say anything else to this um, fact? Cognitive no, no fact I think we covered it well. Okay, great. Um, Then we um, jump to the next one, get a sense of how hard my brain is working. <laughs> um, how do you start 
getting a sense of this. I think this is really, really, really hard to do because you are in this um, moment, you're very focused. I think you're very focused when you read code every time, but how can I um, measure how hard my uh, brain is working? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a, a concept that we discuss in the book as well, that's called cognitive load for how, how full is your brain, how hard is your brain working. And it's interesting, we describe this in the book as well. There's all sorts of cool tools that you can use to actually measure this. Like you have brain devices that you can wear, or you can have a heart rate monitor or devices that measure your, how sweaty your forehead is and stuff. Um, and all these measurements actually correlate quite nicely with a very simple questionnaire. And the questionnaire has one question. And the question is, on a scale from one to nine, how hard is this task that you're doing? This seems to correlate very well with all those biometrics. So on the one hand side, yes, it's very hard. On the other hand side, sometimes stopping and thinking, hmm, is my brain now a nine or is it more a four or a three is already pretty, um, pretty effective. And I think what really matters there also is that the, the feeling that you could do something about it. So if you're all, the, all day doing very complicated things and you're like, oh, programming is really hard. Maybe you actually like it that programming is hard, right? You're like, oh, my brain is working. This, this feels good. Um, then it is the way it is. But once you start using some of the tools that we describe in our book, and there are other books as well that, that cover this topic, once you start to realize that it doesn't have to be so hard, there are things you can do to make your brain work less hard, then it gets really nice because then you can do something about it. You're like, oh, oh, my brain is so full. Maybe if I put some of the thing I'm thinking on a piece of paper, or maybe, and this is exactly also what I was describing with the cognitive refactoring, maybe my brain is working really hard because I'm switching files. It is just not adding. It's not, if my brain is really hard because I have to think of what abstraction to use, then this is like good thinking. This is useful thinking. But if my brain is thinking, oh, I have to switch a file, uh, where was I again? Mm -hmm. It's just not adding something. So once you start reflecting on like, oh, is this useful thinking or is it just wasting effort or searching? Searching is also sort of a waste of effort. Like, oh, I have to switch files. I have to search. I have to go from one, from one breakpoint to the other breakpoint. That's all things that aren't necessarily contributing. Do I have to be afraid um, about when I take a moment and stop to think about how high art am I working to interrupt myself by uh, thinking about this? Yeah, that's a great <laughs> question. So probably you don't want to do it in the middle, right? You're, you're doing a refactoring. It's like half of your tests are still failing. You're like, oh, this is really hard. Let's take a minute to think about this. So that might not be the best moment. But on the other hand, it's also like if your tire is flat, you're biking somewhere and your tire is very soft. You can think, oh, I have no time to pump my tire because I have, I'm, in a, I'm in a hurry. But also if you just pump the tire, you'll be a lot quicker and it also will be more pleasurable to bike. So sometimes it might be worth it. Okay. And then I'm going to take a piece of paper and uh, write down what I'm thinking. Or do you have any um, recommendation or a, a real tool like UML diagrams or would you prefer to just write write down what's on your mind? Yeah, so there are different techniques. And also this depends a bit on personal preference and it depends on the type of thing you're doing. But using diagrams typically can be really nice where, for example, if you are working with different classes and methods, and it doesn't have to be formal UML, it can just be, oh, as a reminder, these are the two things I'm using. These are the objects and these are the methods that connect them. Or um, I, if I work with a programming language, of course, we're doing often parsing. So we have something like a parse tree. So I draw a little tree of what, what I'm doing. And this helps, of course, that I don't have to think of how exactly is it structure or don't have to be in the, in the debug or like clicking open a list and then, oh, the list has children and then it has children. So draw a little diagram that's, that's more clear. But in other situations, writing a comment might be, might be easier. Um, for example, if you find yourself finding the same information two or three times, like I have read my own codes where I was like, why is this again? Oh, I remember it was this. And then three minutes or two hours later, I'm like, wait a minute, why was this method there? Oh, I remember it just for this one edge case. Well, if you do this two or three times, then you're like, oh, hey, this is important information. And it takes my brain energy to find this information. Maybe it's better if I put it there. And in that case, in this specific situation, this isn't always true, but in this case, other people might also benefit. Um, would you also um, 
go and rename functions and variable names in this uh, this moment? Yes, that, that could be that, that, the same situation where I was like, oh, what is this method doing? Oh, this is what it's doing. Now maybe the name isn't good, or it just covers half, or sometimes. When sometimes also when you're very engaged, your brain is so full with solving a problem, you just don't have mental energy left to also make a good name. So then you call something like we know this, right? At least I'm I don't think I'm the only one that does this. Like, oh, okay, this method is just process or analyze or optimize or something. Because it's just like, okay, I'm happy it's working. And then of course afterwards you should sit down and make good better names. But then this doesn't happen because you have to ship stuff. But then the next time you get there, you might be like, oh, what is this again? Ah, okay, let, let me put a good name there now. Um, I, um, I haven't asked for tips for teams um, for the second and the third level of, um, um, of the problems uh, by, uh, with reading code. Um, I think the code reading club covers all of these three things when I... Um, yes understand yes. it rightly um yes. are there any other things at the um the second and third level um which we can do as a team to improve yeah so i think the exercise where you're offloading something to paper this can be paper but this can also be a whiteboard so this mm -hmm. can very much also be something that you collaboratively do collaboratively build these mental models and then you can also learn from each other as to something like a parse tree is easy to visualize as a tree now that i'm thinking of saying this to you i'm like i don't know if all my team members really know this maybe some of the students some of the undergrads that are working on the code base I haven't really figured out that that's a nice way to visualize and maybe they are in the little debugger window mm -hmm opening opening everything you know open 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 which of course also is a tree but that's a lot harder than drawing it so i guess if you do this as a team you can also share diagrams and models that are valuable for certain situations um have you specific tips for pair programming because i um i really think this is hard because uh, some minds don't work the uh, same way uh, so i know i'm a very i don't know how to, to say it right but a pragmatic person i'm really oft like okay i will try this out i will try this out I, until i find the right way until i find the solution and some other people are like okay i write uh, i read this line of code only this line for half an hour until i understand it and figure it out and i'm more like i, I try out um, what will happen when i remove this or that and uh, debug and jump into the next method and uh, so on. And um, I figured out that it's really um, complicated to mix uh, me with uh, one of those uh, theoretical people. Um, but is there um, a tip for pair programming to read code together, which will suit all types of people? <laughs> Yeah, so firstly, I'm not sure if there's really types of people. So partly, of course, it is personality and some people are a bit more cautious and other people might be a bit more like, okay, we'll, we'll see that when we get there. But, but there are other things also in play, like prior knowledge. And that someone that has more prior knowledge of a programming language might have more patience to actually read things because they have also the confidence that reading is going to help. Whereas maybe if you just have less understanding, you might also use different strategies. Like if I'm in a code base where I don't really know stuff that well, I tend to make really tiny steps because I'm like, huh, I, I don't know. This is not because I'm a cautious, I'm not a very cautious person. In my own code base where I know everything, I take huge steps. And afterwards I'm like, wait, all my tests are failing. What? <laughs> But it's very, much, it's, it's very much an interaction of your personality and the way you, you think with what you already know about the code base and also what I found often about tool use. So I tend to use the debugger, but other people might prefer putting print statements. Mm -hmm. This also has something to do with the type of thing you typically work on. Like I was pair programming with someone and I was like, why don't you use the debugger? And it's like, yes, I normally do like development on servers. I work on cloud computing. It's like, yes, so, so I never use the debugger because I'm never on my machine. I'm always deploying stuff in, in AWS. And then I cannot do breakpoints anyway because it's not running on my machine. So I'm not used to that. It's like, oh, that's very valuable. I, I thought like, why are you so stupid? Why are you not using the debugger? <laughs> it is right there in the IDE. But then because of his background, it wasn't so. And then I was like, oh, that makes sense. This is not, it has nothing to do with how your brain thinks. It has something to do with how you're trained and the tools that you're typically using. So I guess pair programming with someone that is less like you 
might have something to do with backgrounds. And once you realize that, maybe it also opens up more communication because then you will not say, well, he is just like this and I am like this, so this will, will not fair mix. You can think, oh, he comes from a different background. Maybe we can learn from each other. But yeah, I mean, in life, there are always people that you really like working with and some people that are just less of a fit in any way. So yeah, I don't have uh, other advice then. Sometimes it has much to do with the type of experience that people have so far. Okay, um, so we're done with the time, but I would uh, ask you for a last recommendation, a last hint um, on reading complex code for the audience. Oh, that's so hard because like, what is my the one thing the one that thing. I could say? So I think the best tip is you can get better at this. So people tend to think that oh, this code is really hard. It will be easier if I throw this code away and if I write it myself, which makes sense from the perspective of someone that has written much code. And I think in, in universities, in boot camps, we never really practice reading code very well. So clearly this is very hard because you have never practiced it. Like I can write a bicycle. I, I can't really write a monocycle, a unicycle. Maybe it's a little bit harder, but also part of it is I've, I've never done this. I've never practiced this. So it is the same with reading code. You can get better at it if you practice it a little bit. So try to try to suppress this urge of, oh, I know how to do this. I can do it. I can do it better because you can also read it if you just put in a little bit of effort. And if you practice this alone or with the team or in pair programming, then your skill will get better. And then it might be a bit more comfortable, even though it will always be hard. Thank you very much, Felina. Uh, Now I, I said the name wrong. I, I knew that That's it was okay. going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you very much. I think it was very interesting. Um, I hope the audience liked it too. And um, I wish you a nice evening and uh, good luck tomorrow with your talk. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.